under the rack. Hello everybody and welcome to Ben je nog aan het kijken, the podcast where we talk to guests about their favorite shows or about their career in television. I am your host Xander de Rijken and welcome to this special episode where we talk to the newest host on one of my favorite TV shows. If you love bad movies, if you love making fun of bad movies and if you love making fun of bad movies with your robot friends, then there's a big chance you're a fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000. The show where some poor soul gets locked in a spaceship and is subjected by mad scientists to endlessly watch cheesy movies while riffing along to keep their sanity originated more than 30 years ago and was created by Joel Hodgson. MST3K ran for 7 seasons on Comedy Central, 3 seasons on the Sci-Fi Channel, 2 seasons on Netflix and is now returning for its 13th season on its own streaming service, the Gizmoplex, powered by King of Chrome and the love of fans. My guest this week is a puppeteer and actress who was handpicked by Joel himself to perform during the MST3K live shows and will be appearing alongside Joel and Jonah as newest host in the coming season of the show. I had the honor to see her absolutely destroy a terrible Roland Emmerich film last year on the MST3K Time Bubble Tour. Please welcome to the podcast the newest test subject on the satellite of love, Emily Marsh. Fingers crossed for that European tour. Oh, yeah. Oh, I will promote the crap out of that. <laughs> I, I know there's I, a lot of inner push. We're like, why have we not gone overseas yet? Let's do this thing. Yeah, I'm, so, we'll see. I'm a unicorn in my country, I think. I'm the only guy actually wearing a Mitchell shirt. I was going to say, <laughs> are most people just like, why is there a drunk man on your shirt? <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, well, it's Belgium. You know, they assume it's, it's something That's beer related. <laughs> Looks like the CEO, that's true. The CEO of, of something here. <laughs> no, and I probably you know, I'm probably the only one has who has seen two live MST3K shows. I know. I was gonna say because did you come? You saw the ones that were in LA, right? Yeah. I think you emailed that. Yeah. Did you see this? Which ones have you seen? Which of the tours? I've seen uh, your show, of course, the Time Bubble tour, which was amazing. By the way, you did a great job. Oh man, thank you so much. That only a little bit of a big shoes to fill, right? You know, just a little bit. <laughs> I know, but um, I, I, I was watching because I always plan my trip first and then see what's going on in LA to see some mm -hmm. shows. And I was happy to discover there was a Mystery Science Theater show. Uh, and I hadn't catch up on all the information that you were going to be a next host or, or doing the show. So we were pleasantly mm -hmm. surprised you didn't make And Yvonne is great too. Oh man, I, I love Yvonne. I swear that the reason we got cast is just because there's almost a full foot of like distance between our heads. And I swear <laughs> that that, that by itself just tickled Joel. I think that might be like 99.9% .9 of the reason we are up there <laughs> together. <laughs> um, and I saw uh, Jonah on the Watch Out for Snake store like oh, awesome. five years ago. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, that... That was a great one too. That was, I think, the first one that they did, right? Right after Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. When they were all fresh and new. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it isn't anymore. <laughs> no, I have to admit, uh, Jonah was my first host because I, I got into MST3K through the Netflix show. Uh, that's awesome. Because honestly, I, because there's obviously, there's a lot of, I should stop talking about this too much because we should save this for the interview. I'm, but I feel like this I'm, show is... I'm kind of going to use all of this stuff already. So I already nice. started recording. I'm not going to use anything illegal against you, but you know, I, I just started in a conversation <laughs> and uh, I try to rope in my questions as we go along. No, absolutely. Well, that's, that's good to know. Because I think with this show... I think something you could critique it with is that there's like, there's a bunch of nostalgia, obviously, yeah. because you do have a lot of fans that have been around since the eighties. Um, and I mean, me personally, I have the story of my dad showed me Joel episodes growing up. So that's like what led me to being a fan of the show. And actually for me, Netflix was, Oh, they're making new episodes of MST 3k. Like that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, so it's been cool to see, because I think sometimes the assumption is that it's like, oh yeah, people have been fans of the show for a while and we don't get new fans. So the fact that you said that like Jonah was your host and you're bringing you into the show, mm -hmm. it's like, 
hells yeah, this show still like gets new people and people engaged in it in a new way. Like it still holds up, you know, I don't know. Cause I feel like there's so many shows out there where you're like, you know, did we really need, you know, a reboot of the fresh Prince of Bel Air? Is that going to be like <laughs> a gateway for this? You know, do we need to get new fans for this thing that we're just rebooting versus MST3K? It's like, no, no, no. Like this is something that, it's not an old, tired thing. Like, there are still bad movies. There's still, like, pop culture references that can be updated. New stuff can be brought in. So, anyway, I, that makes me super happy to hear. <laughs> I do want to see a dramatized version of Mystery Science Theater. Just you guys watching, like, old reruns of True Detective. <laughs> All right. So, hear me out. We have been trying to pitch. It's in a different vein, but we want to do a Hallmark MST3K movie. That's what I'm working on pitching to Joel. <laughs> we are the bad movie you are watching. That would be amazing. Uh, fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. He hasn't been, he's been busy. <laughs> Put it that way. Just a little bit. Yeah. The, also the thing in uh, in my case is uh, I knew Jonah from uh, the Nerdist podcast. Mm -hmm. And I remember him talking a lot about Mystery Science Theater and I didn't know what it was. And then there was an episode uh, where Joel was a guest and mm -hmm. it kind of felt them click. So all these years later, Jonah being the new host of Mystery Science Theater, it was just a, a nice story for me. Like, oh, that's amazing. Like something he absolutely loved. He got to run all these years later. Yeah, absolutely. And that was something that really struck me too for just the filming of this new season, actually. Uh, Because I remember when we've been filming some things, like obviously knowing that Jonah was a fan, uh, Joel's there, who obviously created it. Mm -hmm. um, all of us on the tour were all Mystery Science Theater fans. Like, <laughs> like you really could task Connor, who played Tom Servo in the live tour. Like you could ask him really any episode or any quote. And I swear that he could like pull it out and know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> like the nerd love runs deep. But I never realized until we were filming the new season that one of our props guys came over and he's like, you do know that everybody's here, right? Because they love mystery science theater. And I was like, wait, really? And it just really made me realize I was like, oh, even the PAs, the cameramen, everybody was there and like made this a priority because they were fans of the show. Yeah. So it's to show that it can die and won't die. Yes. Exactly. It's like, it's the little like niche show because not everybody knows it, but as soon as somebody does know what you're talking about, they are thrilled to talk about mystery science theater. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I want to go back to the start in your case, uh, way, way, way back to the start. You were a mystery science theater fan as a kid, I presume. Uh, mm -hmm. You got into puppeteering. So I assume you, you were a big Muppets fan or a Fraggle, Ra Fraggle Rock fan. Something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. what, what was your actually, activity growing up? Actually, funnily enough, my uh, my love of puppets and my fear of puppets are very linked uh, <laughs> because my first introduction to Henson puppets, like other than Sesame Street, which obviously is just bread and butter of being a kid, um, I watched The Dark Crystal mm -hmm. and The Labyrinth, which both were terrifying to me. They are. Both yeah, they are. so frightening. But from that fear came like a love, which still has like gone to this day. Like I can't say enough good things about that Netflix version of The Dark Crystal and huge tragedy that we don't get season two. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely watched those growing up. Watched The Muppet Show growing up. Yeah, just like all of that media, even though it's funny because people have asked um, on the tour, it's like, oh, did your love of puppetry lead you to Mystery Science Theater? And I'll be honest, I always thought of them as two completely different things. Mm. Like in my mind, I never thought of Tom and Crow as puppets. Like their personalities were just so strong that to me, I was like, no, that's that's Joel and the bots. Like that's different. This isn't a puppet show. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, my dad was like a huge, a huge, uh, a British TV fan too. Mm. So I think I always tended to think of like, cause MST3K has that amazing sarcastic British humor thing going on. Yeah. So for me, I almost in a weird way put like, instead of putting it with puppets and Henson, uh, which has much more of that chaotic, like slapsticky comedy sort of a thing. I always put mystery science theater with my love of red dwarf. 
I kind of put those two sci-fi shows together in my mind. Yeah. But both were both were staples in my household growing up. <laughs> I get it. It's like, it's also they're both shows that are uh, science fiction, but you can touch it almost like you can see the cardboard and the egg, the egg, mm-hmm. eggshell casing on it a little bit. Uh, and, and that makes it 100 yeah. <laughs> percent. Get it. I get yeah. it completely. Yeah, I think what what killed the the Dark Crystal show is that it's amazing. It looks great, but it's not really bingeable. Thirteen hours of puppets talking is a lot. Mm-hmm. Just a lot. It's very true, and this might be something. I think they also had kind of a weird problem with that show where they marketed it. I think it won an award as a kids show. Yeah, which that's weird. When I feel like the beginning of the show, they were like we're cool for older kids. And then by the last episode, you have a puppet beat another puppet to death and have blood (laughs) flying on its face. And you're like, just let them be the adult show they want it to be. I feel like it would have ended up being, which is why I think I was excited for season two. I was like, yes, we're going to get dark. They're finally going to like, just let them do their thing. But also it was extremely expensive because mm. the practical effects in that thing were just insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but that also might be me coming from like my puppeteer background where doing TV puppetry has now given me appreciation for really stupid things. Like seeing a puppet place a sticker is like, Oh my gosh, how'd they do that? You have no idea <laughs> that took hours. <laughs> So what what did what did you want to be when you grew up? Where, where was puppeteering something you had your sights set on? Did you want to act? Do you want did you want to do something with comedy? Yeah, so I think always my hope had been to do something with acting, mm-hmm. um, and that's actually what I went to college for was acting because there wasn't really. Uh, we did like Avenue Q our senior year of college. Um, And I had done some puppetry things before that point, but it kind of wasn't something I realized you could do as a career. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then like right fresh out of, I remember my senior year of acting because kind of makes sense. A lot of acting is based on what you look like. And I remember my final year of college was a lot of like, well, you look like, you could play a cop or you look like you could play a young lawyer. And I remember thinking that that was so boring. I was like, this is such a boring conversation and I can do so much more stuff than this. Like this is annoying to me. And then I happened to see that there was this uh, puppet company that out of Cincinnati, which was doing, you know, classic, like put all the puppets in a van drive it to a random elementary school in Illinois, set up the puppet show, do it for a bunch of kids in a cafetorium, and then like drive back. And for some reason that really spoke to me at that moment, I was like, you know what? I want to do puppets because that's not going to be about what I look like. That's going to be about what I can do. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the gateway drug because I did that job. And then because there aren't really like puppet colleges, (laughs) <laughs> in this industry, it's kind of like, oh, you've done one puppet job. OK, you know how to puppeteer. You can do this other job. And then that leads to more jobs and more jobs um, and basically led up to the point where the Mystery Science Theater audition was for a singing puppeteer. So I totally went in there with the expectation that I was trying to audition for GPC. Yeah, I didn't think I was auditioning for any kind of like a human face role. Yeah, and yeah. then that happened to be the surprise when I got the notice that I've been cast from the company. And it was like, oh, you're going to be playing this role that's not puppeteering. And I was like, oh, OK, what is this? And they were like, we've no idea. We're figuring it out. We'll let you know. <laughs> well, the, the puppeteering world doesn't seem that big. I, I think if they, they were looking for somebody, there's not that many people who are qualified to do something like that. It's true. And also you have, um, you don't need too many people either, Mm. which is interesting. It's like how if you actually put together like all of the puppeteers on something like Sesame Street or Muppets, you'd be kind of surprised how little people there are there because they have such an amazing range of like vocals that they can do that one person can play probably five beloved characters on Sesame Street or Muppets. Um, which is great, but for employment standards, a little challenging because <laughs> basically the same people can play all of those roles and will for probably the next, like, you know, however long those shows are on. 
until people retire, basically. Yeah. Uh, so that does keep the world very small and does make it sometimes challenging to get the amount of practice you need to get good at those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm guess I'm thinking of like, I was super lucky and got to do Sesame street occasionally has like workshops that they do in New York where you basically get to do puppeteering on a three camera setup, Mm. which is insane. The fact that they do that is crazy (laughs) because as they point out, like when you see a puppet on film like here, Oh, nice. It's not mirrored either. uh, A camera angle from here is going to look like crap versus a camera angle from here will look good. So you need to like kind of shift as like your monitor image shifts. And so for three camera setups, basically that all needs to happen in a millisecond because they're shooting it like a sitcom. Mm. And in the workshop, like the only people who get to do that really well are those Sesame Street puppeteers who do it for like 10 hours a day for four months. And they expect you to be good at it if you were going to be a part of it. So to do this workshop, it was like two hours to get to realize how bad you are at that skill and how amazing it is that they're good at it. And you're like, and then the workshop's over and you're like, Oh man, no, I want to keep practicing. <laughs> Where's my three camera setup to get good at this. Uh, so it, it is challenging in the world that it is small and a certain amount of people do end up doing that difficult work a lot. And then it's hard to come in and be at their same level. So mm. it's a challenge, but there are ways. I always wondered, is there some form of uh, physical training involved with learning to puppeteer? I ask that because uh, every country has its puppet show. Belgium has its own little puppet show. It's a guy with his dog. And uh, the guy who did the dog is in his 80s now. And his Mm -hmm. shoulder and arms are just destroyed of being, you know, 10 to 20 years behind the floorboard with his hand up in a basket. So I was wondering, Mm -hmm. is there any physical training involved in learning to puppeteer so you don't destroy yourself? Well, I think it's something that's getting a lot more, a lot more attention now. Uh, Cause I think, I think traditionally it's kind of funny. I, I think similar to dancers, puppeteers, there's kind of just been like an expiration date. You know what I mean? It's like, no, if you're strong, you'll just push on through. And if you're, Shoulder collapses. Well, that's because you weren't strong enough to push through it. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, But I think it has it is changing a lot to be, you know, really making sure that you're stretching, making sure to get I mean, I think massages are super important, making sure it stays strong. Funnily enough, um, because I've done a a couple different types of puppeteering, including marionette puppeteering. Crazily enough, Muppet puppeteering like from the shoulder is actually better for your body and destroys you less than marionette puppeteering, which you're like stretched out over a bridge Mm. and all of the effort is in your lower back. Mm -hmm. You know, that place that you totally don't need that protects your spine. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So it's funny. Apparently that style like marionettes really ruins people. Versus uh, Muppet puppeteering, if you do take care of yourself and stretch and ice and try and strengthen up all of the back muscles around it, there are things to like make sure that you're not hurting yourself as much. Even though I think, yeah, I would say in the past, I think there's been a tradition of, you know, break it now and worry about it later. Mm -hmm. But, oh my gosh, if anybody has like a professional puppeteer in their lives and you try touching that muscle there, it's just like rocks. It's crazy. <laughs> so insane. Well, it's so nice to meet somebody who puppeteers because I do have an interest in it. Uh, not doing it myself, but just it fascinates me a lot. It, it did make, make me think about how small the world is because there's there's this ending scene in the Muppet movie where they're all of them, all the Muppets that ever existed are in one shot. And Jim Henson had to fill a pool with people who had never <laughs> puppeteered in their life. So, mm-hmm. yeah, coming from that and, and seeing that world expand a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more, that's really exciting. And, and also fun to see it's not a dying breed, you know, puppeteering is mm-hmm. well and alive. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think even now there's been like a new, there's been like a new attraction to it. Uh, I think almost in direct uh, reaction to CGI 
getting kind of overused, in my opinion. If I was to put on my nerd Lord of the Rings hat for two seconds, yeah. um, I think it's kind of that reaction of you see Lord of the Rings, the practical effects. For some reason, there was a push towards CGI. And I think we've just gotten to a point where even if things like that look really good, yeah. it's less impressive and less tangible than seeing a practical effect. And I think the same thing goes with puppets. Um, and with anime, like in a reaction to animation, animation can do so much, but there is something about like, and there's so much we forgive too, uh, like with the Mandalorian mm -hmm. with the baby Yoda puppet, I feel like you don't have to be a puppeteer to notice that it's a puppet. Like there's certain moments you're like, Oh, it's, yeah. it's moving kind of weird. Like, Oh, the puppeteer didn't do as like good a moment in that moment of puppeteering this thing. But you really don't care mm -hmm. because the fact that it's a tangible thing that you could pick up, it just translates on the screen for some reason. It just makes it so much more like it just invests your emotions so much more. And I think people are remembering that now. I get it. I'm a big uh, Jurassic Park fan, as you can see. And, and you know, that fr franchise has taken mm -hmm. some hits from the fans in overuse mm -hmm. from CGI, but every time they use a puppet, they go berserk. And I get it. I was watching the um, like the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies mm -hmm. uh, on mm -hmm. Blu-ray, uh, seeing Master Splinter, which is just a big rat rat puppet. You have to just say it's a big rat puppet. And you can see mm -hmm. fingerprints on his eyeballs, <laughs> but, but you accept that more than a CGI rat. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Or like the Yoda puppet. Like everybody getting up in arms in Phantom Menace because you're like, what is this? It's a moving blob. Like, what is this? <laughs> Which is just so much more acceptable than even, um, or actually, I apologize. That was in the next movie, Phantom Menace. They did have a puppet, but apparently, I heard through the grapevine, they didn't want to shell out the money for the original makers of Yoda, the puppet builders. Mm -hmm. And they thought they could do it better on their own. But if you notice, that puppet in Phantom Menace looks weird. There's something wrong about it. And it's because they didn't get the same builders mm -hmm. from the original trilogy. So I guess that's maybe an example of where a puppet can get in that uncanny valley where you're like, ooh. <laughs> this, this hasn't aged well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like using an old mold or something. They dusted yeah. some old mold in the garage and printed the Yoda from that. Yeah, exactly. It's like the carbon copy of a carbon copy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, getting back to the, the mystery science theater of it all. So uh, you got the job through mail. Uh, it became a live action job. And that was the tour job, the, the, the first tour you did with Joel? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. Uh, so... That led to the reason that they were auditioning people was because, um, you know, the Netflix cast had basically done two tours. Mm. And at that point, I mean, I would be the first one to say that, like, tour is very physically demanding, Absolutely. Um, especially the way they do it, where it's kind of one night engagements. And so then you get on a bus and sleep on a bus or try to sleep as much as possible. Um, and so basically after two times, uh, the Netflix cast wanted a break and it was going to be Joel's last tour. I mean, it is Joel's last tour, that one. Mm -hmm. um, so to find, he decided that they actually would go to New York and they wanted the puppetry to be more theatrical. Mm -hmm. um, like for people who were able to see that tour, we had things like Crow on a unicycle. Um, <laughs> so. It's like Kermit on a unicycle. Uh, on a exactly. Bicycle. Exactly. No, I think it was Joel's attempt to do some like Henson puppet magic. Um, <laughs> so it made sense that he came to New York and they did an actual like big cattle call of, I think, like 200 people were there or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, just basically looking for some fresh theatrical blood to bring into the tour. And that's how he found... Um, he basically, that's how I was found for the show was from that big audition of like 200 people. Uh, and so that was at the time, there was no discussion about season 13. Um, Joel said that he had been like mulling it over because that was around the time when they knew that there wasn't going to be another season on Netflix that was slightly in the water. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Joel was already kind of thinking over next steps. Uh, but at the time, 
in my mind, I was like, oh man, I'm doing, I'm a part of Mystery Science Theater Live. This is awesome. Sure. Don't know what I'm doing. Don't know how to, long it'll last, but this is like a dream come true. And, and was that the Emily Connor role already, or were you just Emily as a sidekick in that first tour? So that one was, it is so funny looking back on it because, so in that tour, I was originally I, Emily Crenshaw. <laughs> um, the rigor for the cheesy movie circus tour, uh, and more of a sidekick character, I think is a, is a good way to put it. It's like, I would pop in for occasional, like one liners with the bots and, and then like, you know, go back to my dressing room and start playing my switch. Uh, but, <laughs> but, and it was teased at the end of the show in the, in that live tour that was like, Hey, Emily, like, you know, it was just making fun of the original Joel exit where there's a plaque and they're like, what size jumpsuit do you wear? And um, so it was teased that I would take over in some form. But I think there was part of me that just never I never, ever wanted to be like, hey, what does this mean? What am I getting from Joel? Because <laughs> it was just like so nice to be there that I just kind of assumed I was like, eh. Who knows? I, I will assume nothing is happening. Maybe this is just the shtick at the end of the show. And, you know, who knows what will happen? Um, of course, now, years later, Joel will be like, what do you mean? It was all there in the show. Like, he was like, those were all in the works. What did you think was going to happen? Sorry to interrupt you. I love that everybody we has sort of a Joel impression. A little. Yep. Uh yep. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that kind of comes with the territory of just working on mystery science theater. You have to have a Joel impression. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, no, we were so pleasant, pleasantly surprised. I'm not going to keep saying you did amazing, but I am going to keep saying you did amazing because, uh, you know, I was a new fan. My girlfriend is a newer, newer fan of mystery science theater. Mm -hmm. And within a minute, you just clicked right into that show. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I saw that picture of you between uh, Joel and Jonah. Uh, and mm. I thought, holy crap, this works. So, like it, it all fits like the, the purple jumpsuit. Like, the, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's really good. Sorry. I'm uh, mumbling, Ugh. stuttering, but uh, yeah, I'm a fan. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I think it's still always so nice to hear because, you know, when you are a fan of the show and then you find yourself in this situation where, you're being given what you always dreamed of having. And then the last part of that thing is like, well, of course I really want to be here. I hope that my desire to be here fits in with the greater purpose of the show. Like this is serving the show. Uh, Cause I think we've all seen shows where new additions don't click, which sucks. I, th I think that was like my worst fear inwardly is I'm like, I really want to be here. And this really would suck if this didn't work. Um, but getting over that imposter syndrome, uh, that was actually something that was super nice about the MST3K live experience was because filming the episodes, obviously you don't need to find out people's reactions until those are released. Mm -hmm. um, so what was scary, but also really exciting to go into the live show afterwards to like introduce myself basically to fans as a host was... Uh, uh, getting reaction in real time and getting to know if this was something like, you know, if we were accepting the organ transplant or not would yeah. be very evident very quickly in a live tour. And I remember mentally preparing myself before I went on stage for the first time. I was like, you know what? Worst thing they can do is be completely quiet. Don't laugh at anything. Uh, no one will throw tomatoes, but maybe that could happen, you know, just like mentally the worst situation. And uh, yeah, and I was like, well, that'll be okay because it'll still have been an amazing experience no matter what the reaction is. And then to have the opposite reaction happen where people love the show, people have reached out saying they love the show. It still feels super surreal because of how prepared I was for it to be a terrible decision <laughs> and everything to go wrong. <laughs> but it would have been quite a task to be worse than making contact itself. That is very true. We had a pretty terrible movie to rely on on that tour. That, 
So the sequence of events, did you get asked to be Emily Connor before the first tour or did you know there was going to be a 13th season or, or, or did it happen at once? So what all happened was we basically did the first tour and I didn't know anything. Um, you know, whatever hints had been dropped, I was not picking up the hints. I was like, I'm here on tour. This is great. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, we go into the pandemic, which was also insane because our tour ended March 6th. I want to say just totally naturally that that was the date we were supposed to, uh, supposed to end. And funnily enough, when the tour ended, Joel gave us as a, uh, end of tour gift, a baggie with our name on it and a Clorox wipe in it. And I remember for the flight and I remember all of us were like, he's overreacting. Like, what is he talking about? Like, this is ridiculous. And then by the end of that week, I was like, wow, that Clorox was probably worth some actual money. Yeah. Could have actually sold that. (laughs) So it was such a surreal experience to be like the tour ended. I think there maybe had been plans for something else maybe like, I think my expectation was like, Oh, maybe some other tour is going to happen or or something. Um, but then cut to, we did a re-riff event online of an old MST3K episode and then some other online events over like the next year or so, um, during the pandemic. And then kind of, it felt really quickly. There was this momentum in 2021 in the beginning where it was like, Hey guys, we're going to launch a new Kickstarter to try and do a new season. Mm. And it felt like there was, cause we'd just been doing things. We'd all stayed in contact, but then it felt like there was just this new momentum of like, Hey, we're going to really try and self produce this whole thing. Um, so it kind of, and then it was, and it was also that I was going to host some of the episodes. Like that was around the same time. They're like, we're going to split this between hosts. It's going to be you, Joel and Jonah. Um, And into the spider verse MST three K is kind of how I've been (laughs) describing it to people. (laughs) Um, And yeah, it, it just felt like for me personally, I'm sure behind the scenes, the, the timeline is different, but for me, it just kind of felt like April of 2021 all the way until now was kind of like a huge tsunami wave, just like gathering momentum as it was like, yep, you're, you're writing on episode. Like we've raised all this money starting in April. You're going to start writing on episodes in May. Uh, we'll be deciding which episodes you're riffing. Then we'll be filming in October. Then you'll be going on tour. So, uh, yeah, I think that's why I probably still have a shell shocked look about me Mm -hmm. (laughs) is because reflecting back on just how much has happened in the past year, it's uh, it's definitely been tough to get my mind, my brain around because there wasn't a lot of time to process anything. It was just, you know, write comedy, do comedy, film comedy, go on tour. <laughs> I get it. I had the same thing and on a much smaller scale. Of course, touring in Belgium, you drive an hour mm-hmm. that way, you're at the sea, you go an hour that way, you're at the mountains. So this is a ridiculous country, of course. But I mm-hmm. had this uh, really intense tour the moment the the f- like the first lockdown just evaporated, mm-hmm. and after that I went on vacation to Los Angeles. So I I came out mm-hmm. of this fog of just what the hell happened? What did I do? I'm just <laughs> I'm just broken in every place. It feels like <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Have you ever had a tour like that? Did you some, do something like that ever on, on such a scale? Never on such a scale. I, I think my experience with touring had been more similar to what you're describing. It's like that that first one in Cincinnati where it was like loading in our own sets, um, oh, yeah. being kind of like the go-to person when we get to a venue. That had been much more of my experience um, with touring up until that point. And then this one was like, you know, we had a company handling everything. We're going to these big theaters. Uh, there's press to be done. It was, there was also the experience of the first time I did tour. I'd be the first one to say they were not getting their money's worth out of me. Like I basically did 30 <laughs> minutes of the show. I went back to my dressing room. I got to chill. Didn't have to do any press. Didn't really have to like, there was like no, I, my obligations were so low <laughs> on that first tour. Um, also too, it was before COVID. So we basically could do whatever we wanted, mm-hmm. uh, go out as much as we wanted <laughs> more than we should have, but it was so yeah. much fun. 
Um, and then the second tour, it definitely felt like I had a lot more responsibilities in terms of being the human face that you saw the most on stage, um, doing more press, doing more like events, you know, with, uh, backers, with fans, um, so, and then with COVID, the fact that like at any minute, somebody could test positive and then we'd have to shut the whole thing down. Yeah. So there was a lot more obligations this second time that I think just made it a little more, just a little more serious, maybe. Yeah, I get it. Uh, I, I started following you after the show I saw in Los Angeles and you had a, a, a not going to say grueling tour schedule, but, you know, taking in uh, like the morning radio shows you probably have to do and, and mm -hmm. do all those promo talks. It must have been a strain on the voice also, just talking, 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 talking. Yeah, there definitely was. Uh, I definitely was very conscious also, too, of trying not to get sick. Like there was obviously don't get COVID sick, but yeah. then there was also like don't get normal sick. Yeah. Um, because it's just kind of funny with, with the guys who were puppeteering, we did actually have one of our cast members who tested positive while we were on the road. And we had one understudy. So luckily we were able to swing somebody in. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, but it's funny because our understudy is was technically the understudy for everybody. Um <laughs> so she so it was a girl, so she could do Yvonne's part, she could do my part. Oh. Uh, but she had to swing in for crow. Because uh, our Tom Servo got sick. So our crow went over to being Tom Servo and she went in to be our crow. So we had a female crow for a couple shows. Oh, uh, kinda, yeah, it was super kind of sad. I missed that one. I know. I do want to see was, female crow. I know. I, I know. <laughs> I know. It was it was fun. Like it was a happy accident to have. Um, but also, too, it's like I can't say enough about how amazing Kelsey was on the tour. The fact that she had to be ready at a moment's notice to either be Crow or Mega Cynthia, or even for me. And I remember feeling like kind of self-conscious. She looks a little like me, but somebody swinging in for me is a little weirder than just swinging in for like a puppet. So I remember also kind of being conscious about that. I was like, okay, I got to make sure I actually don't go down because I think that's going to be a little more awkward to play off is that like she's brown hair. She has like basically the same length hair as me. Mm. And I was like, are we going to like hope people squint their eyes and like think that's me? <laughs> Hopefully, I guess. <laughs> well, that's a lot of dialogue to remember also. Just uh, every cast members, uh, every line. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. And especially to also the riffs. Talk about uh, that being a difficult mental exercise to know the riff tracks mm -hmm. of all three different people. Um, I think there was only a couple times where also we just had such a good dynamic by the end of that tour. Um, Cause obviously what was super nice is when Joel basically sent us out on the road, he kind of gave us his blessing to play around as much as we wanted. Mm. So we of course were always mucking with things with the riff <laughs> script either either for riffs that i know personally there were probably like five riffs i had that i was like oh man i hate these we got to find something else we got to find something else that's getting a laugh um or just us mucking around in general because you know when you do the same show like 60 times some days you're you're just gonna want to mess with it sometimes oh, yeah. it's like let me see if i can make other people break on stage <laughs> uh, yeah i i did want to ask because i'm obviously interested in, in the making of the show a little bit like so yeah. uh, making contact was your first movie I guess you got to riff fully mm -hmm. and you wrote on it also mm -hmm. that's correct uh, all of us did actually that were in the show um, on the on the tour we all got to write on it how many times do you see the movie before you actually get to riff the movie live so um so it's a combination. So I, I would say, because I know this is like a question that a lot of people have asked is like, how much of MST3K is improv? How much of it is pre-written? Mm. Uh, and basically, so all of it is pre-written, technically. There is something for, there's a whole riff script that's probably like 40 pages long, I think, by the end of it. Um, now, that being said, we definitely always messed with it because certain riffs, when you perform them live, 
sometimes they just don't land. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, clearly that killed in the room, in the writer's room, but that is not working in the, in the theater or things would just come up. So there was the freedom to improv, but it definitely all originally was written out. Um, now that process to write on the movie is super interesting um, because this was one of the first writer's rooms I've been in at this level. And I know writer's rooms are brutal, scary places mm-hmm. for most in most situations. Um, but what's really nice about the MST3K writer's room is, so we take the movie and probably do about 15 minutes, 20 minutes of the movie in a day. So like a five hour day, we'll just be writing riffs for 20 minutes of the movie. Mm. So, and we go probably about like, five minutes at a time, just like stopping every 10 seconds to get everybody's pitches. Um, And they all go into an Excel sheet. (laughs) So the nice thing was that even, I mean, obviously you always had the opportunity for you pitch a joke, gets no laughs and everybody goes, yeah, okay, we'll put that in the Excel sheet. (laughs) And you're like, (laughs) and you're always like, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Let's move on from that bad joke I just pitched. But there is something that's very forgiving about the process that no matter how good or how bad a joke was, it would go in the Excel sheet. Joel was always very insistent that people's names aren't by the joke. Mm -hmm. Um, Because for him, what he liked to do is you compile everything in this Excel sheet for those 20 minutes. Then after you've gone through it, you go back and then assign which riff you want for that moment. So the nice thing is you don't know who wrote the joke. So there's no there's no favoritism for, you know, somebody's joke or who's gotten one recently or anything like that, trying to get rid of that as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and also at that point, you've basically kind of forgotten what was pitched at the beginning of the day. Yeah. So it's nice to go through and get to look at everything with fresh eyes and say like, oh yeah, that that one is the best now looking back on it. Like this is a perfect riff for this moment. Um, but we also got sent on the road with that Excel sheet, mm. which was fantastic. And we were kind of given, you know, we had the permission to put in whatever we wanted. And so sometimes for some jokes, we'd be like, hey, this one actually isn't landing that well. Let's see if there's any other options that we have that they came up with, or let's just come up with something entirely new. Uh, but that has led to an interesting phenomenon where people ask me, they're like, oh man, what, what jokes did you write for this episode? Like what jokes are yours? And I can truly and honestly say most of them, I have no memory, (laughs) no memory of what I wrote, no idea. Like there's a couple lines that I'm like, okay, I, I'm pretty sure I wrote that line, Mm -hmm. but there's almost no record to confirm or deny whether I wrote those jokes. Um, So I like that every MST3K episode, if anybody claims that they know exactly who wrote what jokes, Mm -hmm. they're usually lying because there's no way you could potentially know, which is nice because then it's just a team effort at the end of the day. Well, I love to hear that the show has some similarities with the comedy show that in the tour itself is a pressure cooker where the show evolves and gets better and better and stronger. So it probably was Mm -hmm. a little fine tuned at the end of the tour. Oh, yeah. The show you saw in Los Angeles had changed radically Mm. by the time we were done with the tour. Yeah. Like, uh, personally, I know the um, there was there's the joke of mahogany in that in that show. The puppets rubbing the banister. Yeah. (laughs) It says, I hope this is mahogany. (laughs) So uh, that joke may or may not have like grown to be about 10 minutes by the time we were done with the tour. (laughs) (laughs) Because our performer who played Crow was doing a great job of being Crow. Oh, uh, and, is that and, neat? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and he had just expanded that joke more and more, playing that obnoxious Crow character. So it's us being <laughs> like, stop, stop the joke. <laughs> <laughs> and something like the song, because uh, there was amazing, it was an amazing moment in the tour where Yvonne also joins technically mm-hmm. on stage and sings this song with you guys. How does that that come about? Is it something you wrote in, in advance or you thought you kind of want to fill this moment in with a song? So that, that moment came completely from when 
So there's a special version of the movie we watch where in the corner it has a time count of when the next sound is going to be, hmm. like background sound or dialogue. Um, and there's nothing worse than seeing seeing one of those go to like two minutes. So you're like, oh man, as like the writers, you're like, we have two minutes of silence to fill in this movie with visual gags or like a long running gag. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that that song was all due to the brilliance of our director and head writer, Tim Ryder, because we came in to write on this section. And I think the day before we had tried writing jokes to fill that segment mm -hmm. and like it, it worked, but it was one of those things where it was like a labor the entire time. Like you're just trying to make, especially if you remember that sequence, it's like they're with the scientists, they're going through the basement. It's like, you can make jokes on the basement. You can make jokes on people's like eighties haircuts, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, you're really filling time. And so Tim came in the next day and was like, guys, I did something insane. Uh, let me play this for you. And he had written and arranged the whole thing and recorded himself, like layered himself singing it. <laughs> so it was one of those amazing things that just came out fully formed. And he just gave it to us as this gift. Um, because I think hands down, a lot of people said that that was their favorite part of the live show. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, and I know, yeah, I, I know for us too, it felt like, it definitely always felt like no matter like how the show was going that day, it's like that picked up the energy, like no matter what doing that song. Yeah. For us in the audience, it also was like this testament to like, everybody was just nailing that show. And then came this next level. Of, oh, they can sing also. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course they can sing. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and it's nice too. Cause I, I think, we probably all of us in the live tour come from the theatrical world. Mm -hmm. And, and so it is nice that that was something that totally played to our strengths. It was like, Hey, well, these guys can do this stuff. Like what you've come to expect. I love that. You're saying it's like hitting it at this level and then taking it to the next level. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, everybody, everybody on that stage, you know, when the audition notice went out, it was like, Hey, you got to sing. And man, oh man, did we sing a lot in that last live show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we were in the audience and we were just laughing and, and the, the show had this incredible tempo. And then that song just kept going on also because you think it's going to be a riff of like five seconds and it just goes <laughs> on and on. And there was a guy behind me going, holy shit, like this, <laughs> this, this, this keeps on going. It's a whole song. Oh, that's so amazing. That makes me so happy to hear. I would have paid so much money to get to be in the audience for certain moments of that show, just to know how it lands. And I had uh, the the Jonah cameo also in uh, LA, so that was cool. I know, you did. That was, oh man, I can't say enough things about how Jonah is such an awesome and amazing person. Uh, and I love that it was his idea for that cameo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I thought was just... I mean, if there's anything, I mean, like you said, like on the Nerdist, he showed like what a huge mystery science theater fan he is. And I was always just so impressed by how Jonah would always go above and beyond to be like, like for that cameo, he was like, I bet, I bet the mystery science theater people would be pretty happy if we could give them like a little extra cameo, like mm -hmm. let's do it. Yeah. I mean, and even with all of the COVID things too, cause he had to take a COVID test and all these like red tape to be able to get him on stage mm -hmm. and it was uh it was super fun i'm glad you got to see that show are there any plans to release uh making contact in some sort of mystery science form <sighs> so that's a great question and a lot of people have asked about if any of the live tours will be released mm -hmm. and so we can probably not uh because apparently the licensing agreement to basically some legal stuff that I do not understand at all says mm -hmm. that we can't apparently, Yeah, uh, which is too bad because I would have loved to have some sort of recording of making contact would have loved to have some sort of recording of the first tour I did mm -hmm. with uh, no retreat, no surrender, which is a fantastic movie. <laughs> Cannot recommend it enough. <laughs> yeah, and remind me what, what was the movie from uh watch out for snakes? Oh God. Uh, Ega. Yes. 
I saw them both. All, two movies. It was Ega and I think Puma Man. Yes, 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 yes. That's exactly right. And I know with Ega, all of the people who had been on that live tour, including Jonah, had said that that was one of their favorite riffs they have ever done is doing that movie. And they're all super sad that they don't have a recording of that. So, yeah. but the nice thing is, is that for, you know, going along with the cost of admission and the privilege of getting to be do, doing Mystery Science Theater live, it is cool to know that we can say like, hey, as an audience member, you got to see something that nobody else will get to see. Oh yeah, absolutely. As a fan, you know, I'm happy I saw it. I'm a little bit sad I can't see it again. But as an artist, mm -hmm. it's, you know, um, kind of a shame of the material. You played it, of course, you got the response, but you know, you just want to cherish it and, and, you know, expand it as much as you can. It's true. Even though I would be lying if I said I wasn't really excited not to watch Making Contact ever again. <laughs> How many times you ha have you seen the movie at, at the end by the end of the tour? I would say we did 60 shows. And we probably watched it at least 20 times, <laughs> if not like 40 for writing. That's so a, I would guess probably a hundred times I've seen that stupid, stupid movie. That's a lot of making contact. I think that movie even can exist by the day's turn because there's so much licensing problems in that movie in my head. It's, it's so insane. The amount of products they had. And I guess because it was a German movie when it was made, they just thought that people wouldn't care. Like... Yeah. That Star Wars wouldn't care, I guess. They wouldn't come after them or Disney wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I guess they didn't. So I guess Roland Emmerich was right in the end. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to ask about the show now. So the Gizmoplex is up mm -hmm. and running in a beta mm -hmm. in a beta phase. But mm -hmm. as the podcast will release, the Gizmoplex will be available for everybody, I think. Uh, yes, there's going to be the, um, the official premiere is going to be the beginning of May. I probably have a specific date somewhere in my email that I need to check, but beginning of May <laughs> yeah. is, uh, I think, when we will be we'll be having the premiere. And how is the so. process for making the show? So was there any difference uh, with the tour shape of the show and, and the show itself? Yeah. So I'd say the biggest difference is... You know, you've mentioned, obviously, we've talked about the process of, hey, a joke doesn't get a laugh. Oh, awesome. Let's go in and tinker. Let's do it again. Uh, you have time for it to become like you don't even have to think mm -hmm. about doing it anymore. It's just become so in your body. The shows filming it are, is almost the opposite because <laughs> you do a sketch twice. And we did uh, the new season is all done in um, single shots. Mm -hmm. We didn't have really have cuts to go in between for the, like the traditional sketches. So very similar to the original way they did it, which was great, except a lot of pressure because if you mess up something, then we just need to start it over again, mm -hmm. <laughs> which kind of led to, I think, some happy accidents where you get to the end of the sketch and you're like, I really wish I could redo that one moment. And that people are like, no time. We have to go. <laughs> we have to do the next thing. <laughs> So I have no doubt that there will be some things people see in that new season where I'll be like, yep, that that was that was a flub. That was a mistake, <laughs> but <laughs> it was passable and it was still funny. So fantastic, which and I think it kind of is more, you know, this this show has never been some slick, perfect, no. uh, flawlessly produced kind of a show. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think even the hurry up and go of making the season. I think we'll really give it a endearing charm is what I would imagine. Cause what you were seeing on screen is exactly what was happening backstage. It was like mm -hmm. almost kind of reminded me a little of like a more working noises off. If you've ever seen that play. I've, I've been tracking people on like on the subreddit and, and the fans about the new Gizmoplex and people really liking like the new episode that released because it has that more eighties feel like the Netflix show being too slick for some people, too mm -hmm. refined. So it, it the new episode, the new episodes are bringing back like some old mystery science theater charm. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> no. I mean, it definitely it definitely felt like 
Joel even mentioned that when we were filming, that it felt a lot more like when they were originally doing it for the KTMA days. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think when you're too precious and you have too much money, things can just end up being, you know, it's, and like I said, I guess that's always been the charm of the show is they're making it work under difficult circumstances. Um, and it, and it felt like we were back to that, but we, we pulled through in some really like cool, amazing ways. Um, and it definitely took like a whole village, like by the end of that shoot, both times, I feel like I was best friends with everyone on that set, <laughs> like down to all the PAs, uh, down to our pops builders, like, it just, it really felt like such a, I don't know. We felt like such a ragtag group that we're doing this against all the odds. And mm -hmm. it was just so, I don't know. It was, it was a great experience and I, I can't wait to see the final product. Um, from your new episodes, is there a favorite one already? Like you, you think you did three or four episodes for this new season? Is there one mm -hmm. you should be looking out for? Um, the first one that's released there is uh there's a song in it a uh beastie boy style rap if you will <laughs> um i am i may or may not be wearing a wig in this <laughs> in this um i am very excited to see that that song uh and especially too as a little background we did it the first time and i did it perfectly and we went okay cool let's do it again but just for a safety we then, I then personally proceeded to mess up the shot four times, <laughs> <laughs> uh, including like, and this is when people see it, they'll see that there's like kind of a, I'm putting in quotes, a full costume change. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to do that full costume change like four times because <laughs> personally I was not doing it right. So I'm very excited for everybody to see that in the first episode that I will be in. Do you have a favorite Mystery Science Theater classic episode? So my favorite Mystery Science Theater classic episode is one that me and my dad and my brother watched all the time, weirdly, which is uh, Attack of the Killer Shrews. Hmm. Yeah. It's it's definitely, uh, when I went back and rewatched it recently, because it had been a minute since I saw it, I was like, why was this my favorite episode as a kid? Cause there's a lot of just talking and drinking. There's not a lot of activity in that movie, mm -hmm. but I think there was always something for me as a kid. I just loved like the finale when they've got those stupid shrew puppets, which are just dogs covered in bath mats. And <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there was just something. And then my favorite short I would say is with Mike and it's uh, destination Venezuela. <laughs> also a very, a very good short. Do you have a favorite mat? I know it's all love on a satellite of love, but do you have a favorite mat? Oh, I think there's something there's something about Pearl. That's okay. what I would say. Absolutely. There's something about I just love that she was such a disruptor when she came into the show. <laughs> just really enjoyed her. And uh, if you had to pick one bot to survive on the satellite of love, one bot. You know, it's a hard question. You love them, you love them all, but one bot. I know. I think, I think if I had to go one bot, I'm, I'm on the record here. It would be Crow because deep down inside, I just love pessimistic and sarcastic humor. I just love uh, it so much. There's so. a certain sweetness to Tom Servo, but yeah, he's a. I. It really is a great personality test. I think it's yeah. like under under everything. Are you a sweet person? Or are you just a chaos monster? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm a chaos monster. I love crow. I get it. And we, we've had a, a run of incredible crows over the years, also. I know that 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 makes it hard too. Uh, and I do love like the Netflix iteration too. I mean, yeah, they're they're monsters and man, they're fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Emily, for doing this uh, and making the time. I really enjoy talking to you and I'm, I'm really excited for the new season. Oh, man, I'm so glad. And Xander, thank you so much for coming to see the show and for reaching out and, oh, you know, yeah. for staying up. However, God knows how late it is right now in Belgium. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It is. It is. Um, it's eight o'clock. Okay. Thank goodness. 
This was Bijna Gaan Het Kijken for this week. For the people interested, you can see Emily get tortured with awful movies alongside Tom Servo and Crow and returning hosts Jonah and Joel in the 13th season of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Now streaming exclusively on the Gizmoplex. The MST3K streaming service available worldwide starting May 6th. Thank you for listening. Don't hesitate to drop something on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or our Discord if you enjoyed this episode and want to share it with your followers. I was your host Xander de Rijke and we'll binge again next time. Met Xander de Rijk.